So welcome back. This is episode 192. This week I'm joined by fellow fee-only financial advisor and fellow Blue Hen, Andy Panko. And Andy is the president of Tenon Financial located in New Jersey. And today we're going to talk about index universal life insurance and try to dispel many of the myths that are being portrayed about it um, on social media. Um, and as a reminder, if you're serious about getting a plan in place for retirement, then consider signing up for my in-person or online retirement planning course, Retirement Readiness Review. If you live in Connecticut, consider attending in person. But if you live outside of Connecticut, consider signing up for the on-demand course. And to learn more, head over to retirewithryan.com. So welcome, Andy. Hi, thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. And just to clarify, if anyone doesn't know what a blue hen is, we are both University of Delaware graduates. You, Dell. That's right. And I don't even know what blue hen <laughs> means. I think it was like a Civil War reference where those from Delaware called themselves the blue hens as they were fighting, or, or so I'm told. Yeah. You, you know, it, is a, it is a mascot, right, as well. So, yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so thanks for coming on. Um, and, you know, so as I mentioned, we're here to talk about index universal life insurance or IUL for short. So for those who don't know, maybe just tell listeners, what, what is that? Yeah, so most people listening probably haven't heard of it, or if they did come across it, it'd be under a different name. And the reason why this is important for retirement, retirement planning is the product is often pitched and marketed as a retirement income tool toward, you know, sure. toward retirees. It'll go by names, different marketing names, such as laser fund, private reserve account, tax-free retirement account, section 7702 plan, and a, and a host of other creative names. Uh, it, complicated product. It's not inherently good or bad. I should start by saying I don't dislike sure. IUL. I'm not saying people should or shouldn't buy it. What I take issue with largely on behalf of consumers is the way it is uh, often sold inappropriately with half truths with misleading statements etc so that's what we're here to talk about sales yeah. myths not you know saying the product's sure. bad um, super high level it's a life insurance policy where in addition to having a death benefit it can build up some cash value within the policy with that cash value you can take loans against it uh, you can take money out of it there's also additionally other benefits sometimes, like you can use some of that, that benefit toward long-term care expenses, as opposed to only having to get benefit from it if and when you die and get the death payout, you, you can sort of tap it in other ways during life. So it, it could be a very uh, useful, multi-purposed product, but there are lots of uh, misleading and or outright false claims often made about it in the sales process. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I would agree with everything you said. It, it has a place. And, um, you know, I, for whatever reason, I've started to see lots and lots of ads on my Facebook, on yeah. uh, Instagram. And I don't know if it's because maybe when you click on one that now they you get served up all the other ones. <laughs> that, that's definitely yeah. part of it. But also the product as a whole, objectively speaking, sales data from from LIMRA, L-I-M-R-A, I forget what it stands for, Life Insurance Marketers something, Association something. or something, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, if you look at the, the uh, largest growth in insurance products over the last decade, it's been IULs by total amount sure. of premium sold. Now, it's tough to say, is that because people genuinely demand it or just sort of the sales machine behind it has pushed it more? I, I'm convinced it's the yeah. latter. But, uh, you know, regardless, it, it has been growing in, in uh, usage and, in, in, uh, you know, folks who have them. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've. Uh like you said, it's presented in a lot of different ways. I mean, you probably heard the commercial, like I used to hear it on the radio, you know, you can bank on yourself, uh, you know, the secret yeah. that Wall Street doesn't doesn't want you to know about, right? That's one of the one of the ways it's pitched. Right. Yeah, I, I have a handful of common myths I'd like to dispel. Sure. Uh, now, so, some of these are outright just false. Yeah. Some of them are half truths or heavily massaged or sort of cherry picked. Let's start with one, and this one's just outright false. People who sell it will often say, it's a secret the wealthy don't want you to know about. Yeah. <laughs> as, as if to sort of conjure up some sort of sense of, I'm missing out. If the rich are doing it, I should too. That's just pure sleight of hand parlor trick. The rich don't care what you do or don't yeah, do sure. with your money, whether or not you buy life insurance. So anyone who says that as part of their pitch should be looked at with suspicion and, and you know, probably shouldn't proceed with a relationship with that person if that's one of their talking points. 
Sure. And the thing that I, I mentioned earlier is that, you know, we're fee only advisors. We don't sell insurance. Um, we're just trying to do what's best for our clients and, and the people that are selling this and that not that there's anything wrong with that, but they are licensed insurance agents. Um, and they're only getting compensated if they sell this uh, product generally. And they also are not fiduciaries. So they're not required to look out for your best interest also. Right. And, and just side note, to, to your point, those who only sell insurance and don't have licenses to sell securities or manage investments, they have a different regulatory body that oversees them, specifically the different state insurance regulators, as opposed to, you know, the FINRA That's or right. SEC, the yeah. National Securities. And it, it, it really is a sadly disjointed patchwork of oversight across the state. So just a quick example. I was in a Facebook group where there was a guy from South Carolina who sells insurance and he was pitching IUL pretty hard into the group and made some just outward, you know, outright false claims, one of which we'll discuss, I'm saving okay. for last year. And so I, I reached out to a state regulator and, and said what he said. They said, yeah, that's not right what he said. And they said, where am I located? I said, why does that matter? And they said, well, because you're deemed to be the client. I said, I'm not buying. <laughs> I'm just a guy in a Facebook yeah. group where this guy from South Carolina is talking to the world on sure. Facebook. Who knows how many people are watching, listening. And they said, sorry, but you're deemed to be the client, so you have to reach out to New Jersey. So I called New Jersey insurance regulator. They said, is the guy licensed in New Jersey? I said, no. They said, we can't yeah. help you. So just like that, this, this Yahoo is free to say absolutely whatever yeah. he wants, no matter how wrong it is about the products he's selling. And neither South Carolina nor New Jersey is willing or able to do anything about it. Yeah, it's, it's it scary. is scary. The insurance, um, you know, regulators really don't have – uh, or don't have a lot of teeth to what they can do, or they're just not extremely focused on it. I mean, I had a prospective client come in to meet with me who had gone to the typical dinner seminar, right? Free dinner, and he goes into the person's office, and the person is telling him, well, I'm a fiduciary, I'm a fiduciary, and it even says it on their website, um, you need to buy this annuity, different product, right? Um, but right. this person has no securities license, so it, they're not a fiduciary, obviously. Uh, but they're running around saying they are because it's obviously a much better for the client if you are, but there's nothing happening to them um, be it by doing this, you know. Yeah. And largely, I suspect the state regulators are just really underfunded, understaffed. Yeah. They, they have to focus their efforts when someone actually is damaged and sold a bad product that really blows up on them. That's what the regulators save their energy for. You know, it's hard to go around trying to wrangle all these cowboys saying God knows sure. what on social media. They just don't have the yeah. resources, right? You're right, yeah. doesn't make no. it right, but at least, you know. That's right. We underst I think I understand why it happens, why people get away sure. with it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what would be another uh, falsehood you've seen out there? Next one, th this one's a really twisted half-truth, is talking about fees. Those who sell IULs will often say their fees are low or one I saw recently, someone said the IOL fee will be lower than that of a well-managed mutual fund. Okay. <laughs> now this is where it gets complicated, but with an IUL, it's, it's a multi-decade long product. It's not something, you know, it is a lifetime commitment. You don't buy it, expect to get in and out sure. in a year. The fees up front are really large. Um, but there's premium issuance charges, there's surrender fees, there's a cost of insurance, et cetera. There's administrative charges, premium tax. Those things add up in the first year could could be an excess of ten percent. Yeah, the, the total fees, and the second year, third year, it could be six, seven, eight percent. By the time you get to the tenth year, the fees can be low from that point forward, such that decades down the road, each year's fee could be well under 05 percent sure. in those later years. But you can't get to those <laughs> later years without having gone through the first years where you're paying. I have an IUL that's properly structured and, and funded accordingly, 17% fees in the first wow. year. Doesn't mean it's bad, I know yeah. what I got into, but point is fees are really high sure. initially and then do taper off. When you blend it out over the life of the product, no. The, the, the fee in, in the best structured and best funded IUL could be under 0.5% on average, but it's not gonna be like the 0.10% or lower that you sure. get in typical index funds, for example. So sure, the fee could be lower than a really you know piece of garbage one and a half percent annual fee mutual yes. fund, 
but I can't see any way possible where even the best IUL, the fee over its life, blended over its life, is going to be below 0.10, even 0.2 percent. It just I, I don't. Yeah, that's not reasonable to expect. Yeah, and and you're paying that up front, so you're already starting behind, right? I mean, <clears throat> you pay 10 percent right away, only 90 percent of your money is yeah. getting invested. Um, you know, and you, and so if it's in an indexed IUL, which is what it is, right, in an index fund versus a S&P 500 index fund, the S&P 500 index fund, the fund is lower, but it's also starting out ahead. Yeah. So technically, these aren't invested in index funds. This is where they get more complicated. You get exposure through the insurance company buying options, call options, basically, on the underlying index. So that's how they get their exposure to the underlying index. you're not actually invested in the index funds, sure. which is why people who sell these don't need securities yeah. licenses because the policyholder isn't actually owning securities directly or indirectly. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the fees, just because fees are high in the beginning, again, it doesn't mean these products are yeah. bad. Like I said, I bought one, eyes wide open, knowing what to expect. I do plan to hold it for the long term. And I do think my fees blended over its life could get below 0.5% but they're not going to come close to the 0.05, 0. 0.10% sure. of, of a typical mutual yeah. fund, or, you know, uh, index fund. Yeah. So be clear sure. about that. Um, next common one, very common one, is people will, will say that IULs can give you a tax-free retirement. Yes, <laughs> that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'd be awesome. Now, to be fair, there are some people, some scenarios, some circumstances where they can ultimately be in a tax-free scenario in retirement, and IUL can be a part of it. But for the average person, I'm going to go so far as to say an IUL isn't going to get you to a point where all of your income is tax-free. Yeah. You likely have Social Security, maybe a pension, maybe you got a brokerage account, maybe you have a rental property. Like The IUL could help potentially manage the taxability of your income decades down the road, but it's not going to wipe out Sure. The, the taxability of your income from, again, pensions and rental properties, et cetera. So there could be tax benefits to it, specifically from taking loans against your policy is how these are designed to work. That's your tax-free income is really just borrowing against it. Um, but to say it'll, it'll get you to a tax-free retirement, you know, alluding to like all of your retirement sure. is going to be tax-free, that's a real far stretch. So yeah, and I'd go so far as to say that's a myth. Yeah, I mean, obviously tax-free would be a Roth account, right? IRA, 401k. I mean, that's the predominant way that uh, somebody would do that. Uh, you know, as long as Congress keeps those laws the same when you go to t- take your money out, that's the big unknown, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Each product could sure. have tax-free income, like Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks. If you meet conditions, all distributions are tax-free. Even IUL, when you borrow cash against it during your lifetime, like any loan, you know, you borrow against your house, loan proceeds aren't taxable sure. income. Borrowing against a life insurance policy is conceptually the same. So it is true that the cash flow you get from an IUL during life could be tax free. It doesn't directly translate to tax free retirement. That's right. Yeah. You know, which to me implies like the, the, the whole of your financial sure. picture. And plus That's when you take the loan, you're paying a, you're paying interest on the policy as well, right? Generally. Yeah. Correct. There's no free yeah. lunch, nor should yeah. there be. Like, uh, no bank or insurance company should lend you money for free. Sure. There's a cost for them to get that money, and they pass that cost on yeah. to you by, by you paying interest on it. Yeah, so. makes sense. Yeah. Um, next one, you, you sort of touched on this, the be your own bank yes. thing. This is one of those sort of massaged uh, liberal interpretation of what it means to be a bank. <laughs> so rest assured, you are not a bank. The insurance company from which you borrow money against your policy is not a bank either. So you are not being your own bank. Where this comes from is that it's true you're not borrowing money from a bank. And it's also true that the money inside your policy, the cash value of your policy, still stays there and still earns interest. So when they say be your own bank, they mean like your investment's still there, still getting its interest. And you can borrow against that and use those borrowings for whatever you want to go buy another investment, to pay for yeah. life, to pay for yeah. college, to pay for whatever. So that, that's a key distinction versus if you just go to like a, a credit card to borrow money, for example, you're not 
there's no investment behind yeah. it. You're not earning any interest. You're just simply paying interest for that loan. With borrowing against a cash value life insurance policy, the gist is that you still have some asset earning interest. You're just borrowing against it as collateral. That much is true. But it's, it's no different functionally than if you take a home equity line of credit against your house. You still own your sure. house. You still get the full price appreciation of your house. You just have a loan collateralized by your house. Same thing with a cash, cash value life insurance policy. You still have the cash value, still earning interest. You're just taking a loan against it. So it, it's no more accurate to say be your own bank with an insurance policy than it is to say be your own bank by borrowing against your yeah. house or taking a margin loan against your brokerage account, investable assets, right? You still own those assets. You're taking a loan against it. No one in their right mind would say you're being your own bank by borrowing money against your brokerage account. Yet many people who sell insurance will use the be your own bank pitch as some sort of unique special benefit yeah. of borrowing against a life insurance. Because it sounds policy. better, right? You're going to beat the bank. Sounds yeah. amazing. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've heard. <laughs> Sign me yeah, up. Yeah, like I've, a lot of these, a lot of people have written books, right, to help sell these products. Um, you might have read some of them, right? Um, you know, the, and yeah. so one I read said, oh, yeah, that's how Walt, Dis Walt Disney founded Disney was because he borrowed against his uh, whole life policy and he built Disney with that. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. But <laughs> Uh, funny you bring that up. So I did the research on that, at least as best as I could yeah. find with publicly available information. And that's another common pitch is, is insinuating that Disneyland wouldn't exist if not for life right. insurance because Walt Disney took a loan against his policy to fund the inception of Disneyland. Yeah. That much is true from what I can find. I found an article on Huffington Post, I want to okay. say, that, that summarized the history of the foundation of Disneyland and where the capital came from. All said and done, assuming this article is accurate, Walt did take a $50,000 loan against his life insurance policy back in 1952 or okay. something. There was another seven and a half million dollars <laughs> of capital he got from ABC, the broadcasting station, sure. um, and somewhere else like Western Lithograph or whatever. All said and done, it was 0.66% of the total capital required to, to launch Disneyland, 0.66% yeah. of it came from his life insurance loan. So this is one of those half truths again. It is accurate sure. to my knowledge that a loan was taken, but it was such a small percent yeah. of the total capital needed to actually launch Disneyland. It's real misleading to, to sort of massage the message to make it sound like life insurance was the missing link that made yeah. this all happen. <laughs> so. Yeah, don't let, the, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, Andy, come on. <laughs> Right, yeah. exactly. So, you know, you can massage this to, to, to frame it however you want to frame sure. it. And that's, that's my, my complaint with a lot of these yeah. insurance sales. They're not always flat out false claims, but they're heavily, you know, massaged and sort of manipulated and tweaked claims to really give the benefit of the doubt or, or really put this super yeah. sort of rose colored lens around. Look at the magic of what life insurance does. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Next one, this one's kind of technical and, and will kind of fall on deaf ears for most people, but it, it rings a certain spot in my heart because I came from institutional investing in finance where a big part of what we did at the large banks I worked at was having to have capital or, or assets sure. that were that met certain requirements. And there'll be tiers. There's a tiering system to those. Tier one, for example, means you have a certain amount of capital or assets to uh, to weather, you know, rough sure. spots yeah. in your operations, basically. And so a common insurance pitch is that life insurance is a tier one asset for the banks, okay. thus implying it's super safe, super liquid. Uh, banks own it. You should, too. This is another half truth where it is true that life insurance is considered a tier one asset or goes into the calculation of tier one assets for banks but so does literally every other asset on a bank's balance sheet. <laughs> that includes the dastardly stocks yeah, that yeah. insurance people <laughs> like to denigrate and say super risky. It includes bonds, it includes loans they have, it includes mortgage-backed securities, it includes fancy esoteric financial derivatives. All assets on a bank's balance sheet are ultimately part of its tier one capital. Life insurance is part of that. 
So again, it, it's accurate to say it's tier one, but it's sort of a, a false framing to use that sound bite as if to imply because life insurance is tier one, it's got to be good. Sure. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, so th that's another. It's got to be better than the stock market, right? It, it, you know, as a comparison, right. yeah. Even though it is the same, yeah. Um, <laughs> And this one really rubs me the wrong way because, again, I, I have the benefit of having come from institutional role where I was involved in some of the capital calculations for this tier one regulatory reporting. And I, and I know anytime I see someone who sells insurance make this tier one asset pitch, I'm like, they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. So I asked them about it and, and pretty quickly, you know, their understanding or their knowledge, you know, it's clear it's not there. And so they're, they're, this is what bothers me is they're given this sound bite in whatever sales training they yeah. got from someone else who doesn't know what they're talking about, but they heard it from someone, et cetera, et cetera. And they just keep regurgitating this, oh, it's a tier one yeah. asset. Tell people that, tell people that, right? It's like, you have no idea what you're talking yeah. about, yet, yet you're just throwing it around there liberally. So that's what bothers me. Yeah, and I mean, not to knock anyone who has an insurance license, right? I formerly had one. Um, you know, it's obviously required to sell this, but it's not that difficult, you yeah. know, to get an insurance license as far as the testing is not that hard, you know. Right. Uh, agreed. And, and uh, like I should also say, I don't mean this to say all people who sell insurance are bad. Far yeah. from it. Insurance is important. I have a lot of it. I appreciate it. I, I recommend it to clients, insurance, annuities, etc. But when I think it makes sense, I'll give them guidance on here's where I see it fitting. I intentionally don't sell insurance or have licenses to sell insurance. So I, I have a trusted network of, of folks I'll reach out to and basically uh, coordinate the client talking with them to, to figure out the best insurance product and you know consummate the sale, et cetera. So I'm not saying this to bash everyone who sells insurance or to bash insurance as a product. But there are, no doubt, lots of people who sell insurance who are concerningly ill-informed yeah. about what they're selling and or know what they're doing and are intentionally being underhanded about how they're selling yeah. it. In both cases, it's a problem, yeah. right? You know, uh, ignorance isn't a defense. Yeah. So I'm just one person trying to bring attention to it. And uh, if I can help even just one consumer learn something and avoid a sale they're going to regret because they bought something on false pretenses or, you know, because it was misexplained to them, all of it's worth it then if I can help just one person. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, what would be next uh, on your list? Uh, I got a couple more. The This next one you'll see thrown around a lot. Once you're in the algorithm feed, like you <laughs> said, you clicked on something and now you're going to yeah. get bombarded with, with uh, IUL related posts. There's different um, ways and pitches and claims saying that IULs are better than 401ks. Sure. This is a really common sales pitch point um, where people who sell IULs will, will make up some chart or they'll be, you know, they'll recycle a chart someone else made and it'll say, look, here's IUL in this column, here's 401k in this column, here's a bunch of different points of comparison. IUL looks amazing. It does this, check. It does that, check. It does that, check. 401k does not do that, does not sure. do that, does not do that. So on the surface, to, to the untrained eye, unsuspecting consumer, it's like, oh man, this IUL looks amazing. It absolutely destroys my 401k. Sure. But the problem with these charts is that they'll, they'll cherry pick the points of comparison yeah. to intentionally pick things that make you know, the favor of the IUL, or they'll uh, very subjectively respond to the points of comparison. Um, and even stepping back further, it's, it's apples to bananas. Like sure. a life insurance product is fundamentally very different than a traditional investable account like a 401k. There's some similarities, but at their core, they're very, very different. So it's never going to be a valid comparison. Yeah. They each have their pros and cons. They each make sense at certain times. It's not that you have to do this or sure. that. Yet there's, there's no shortage of, again, people trying to pitch and sell IULs in the premise that 401k is garbage. IUL is where it's at, ditch your 401k, roll it into this IUL that I'm selling. Yeah. Um, some of the, the common points of comparison that they'll say is that 401k has vari you know, variability and you can lose money in it and there's no guarantees. And the people who, who write that comment, they're, they're thinking about just stocks sure. and stock investments, right? Which yeah. is true. There's volatility. They can go up, they can go down. 
But what they fail to realize is many 401ks do have guaranteed yeah. investment options like a stable value fund or managed income or portfolio market, or whatever it might you know? be called. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Where it is principal protected and you get some positive amount of interest. But you know the, the comparison won't no, say that. Yeah. It'll just make you think like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose all my money in my 401k. Yeah. Um, another one is that 401ks, you have to pay tax on it. And in an IUL, you don't. Well, in a 401k, what, what they leave out is that the money you put in got you a tax That's referral right. in the first place. With an IUL, yeah. you don't. You have to fund an IUL with already taxed sure. money. So it's just one of these, like, I've seen some really egregious charts where it's like, oh, my God, how is this person allowed to get away with doing this? And some other ones that are a little more respectable. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's never going to be a fair comparison to do this. Neither one is better than the other. They have pros and cons, but, you know, they are what they are. So anyone who shows you a graph saying, forget your 401k, do an IUL because look how sure. good it looks, and turn around and walk the other way. Yeah. They, you know, they don't, they're not being honest or they don't fully understand what they're selling. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and four hundred one k's. You know, when you work for a larger company, those fees can be pretty minimal as well. Um, you know, as a comparison, right? Right. Yeah. That that's another one making the rounds. There was a article, I think it was SmartAsset dot com in December of twenty twenty three that said the average four hundred one k fee is two point two percent. That doesn't sound right. I, I, <laughs> no. I, no, exactly. I have no idea where they got that from, but I've seen multiple people who sell insurance recycle that article, or there was a video where Tony Robbins was on some CNBC show or something talking about investment fees. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Wall Street does have a yeah. lot of fluff and excess in their fees. So I agree with that in principle. But to say the average 401k fee is 2.2%, I just, that's not my experience. No. I, I've, I've reviewed dozens of 401ks for people now, generally speaking, the larger the company, the larger the plan, the lower right. the fees will be versus really small yeah. companies. But the large companies, I've seen many 401ks where people are paying all in 0.10%, sure. 0.2% yeah, per year, right? Yeah. Even small ones, not to say 2.2 doesn't exist, but I've never seen anything over 2%. So to say that's the average is really questionable to me. I'm not saying that Smart Asset didn't find that somewhere, but... I, I don't know what kind of rigor they use in their research and data collection because that is so far from that from might what, have been maybe uh, most people I know 15 years ago or something, you know, pre Department of Labor ruling. I mean, a lot of companies Possibly. have been sued because their 401k fees were high. But I think most companies have done a good job. Bigger companies of lowering the fees that their employees are paying um, in those right. plans. Yeah, because yeah, they have exactly. to, right? You know, fiduciary duty exactly. as, as a 401k administrator and sponsor, you have yeah. to. Act, act in your participants' best yeah. interest, or you get sued if you but, don't, and that, yeah. that's been happening. Yeah. So the uh, the last point I wanted to mention, and this is the most false and dangerous, is uh, there's one guy, like I said, the guy in South Carolina that I, I reached out to his regulator about. He referred to IULs as a can't lose mm -hmm. money asset. Okay. Categorically yeah. false. You can definitely walk away with less than you put into this. Uh, what he's referring to, and this is where, again, they get cute with the wording. This gets a little complicated, but the, the cash value component of your account earns interest any given sure. year. In an IUL, that interest will never be lower than zero, can never be negative. Any given year, they get somewhere between zero and some positive amount of interest. Right. That belies the, the claim that you can't lose money. But you can't own that cash value in isolation. This product is first and foremost life insurance. There will, will necessarily be fees associated every with year, that. The cost of insurance, administrative charges, et cetera, yeah. every year. So even in those years where you get zero interest, you know, the, the stock market has a really bad year. It's true. You won't get negative interest in your cash value, but you still have life insurance fees and costs still come out. So your cash value will decline in those sure. years. That is losing money. Now, granted, it's losing money because of fees, not because of market performance. But that's mixing words. You know, if you're a client, you're a consumer, you put $100,000 into this thing, and the next year it's worth whatever, $95,000, like you lost sure. money. I don't know how you can try to argue to someone that <laughs> yeah. they didn't. So um, 
any derivation of can't lose money, you know, won't decline, can't go down, that's just categorically false with IULs. And plus, too, early on, most of these have a surrender schedule, like a commitment period, where if after a year or five, you want to walk away with your money, they're going to charge you a fee to get back your money, usually. So, um, yeah, Correct. so yeah. you're also, yep. man, it's not a loss, but it's a, a fee you'd pay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that was one of my comments. Anytime I see someone say this can't lose money, I'll say, if I put in 10,000 this year, how much can I take out next year? <laughs> yeah. And they'll say, well, you know, I don't know it's not a short term product. It's yes. meant to have for the long term, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. So if you do hold this product the rest of your life, you're eventually, you know, you ride out that surrender area, that surrender sure length of period and you will in time have more cash value than what you put in so yes it, it can and should grow over time but in the early years you will have less money than you put in that, that's factually going to happen especially in the first year so anyway yeah. you know to me that's losing yeah, money. for if, sure if i'm ever in a position where i can only get out less than i put in i lost money that's so, right yeah you know, let's not mix the words yeah, it's here. Not, it's not money market. It's not a CD, right? It's, it, it's, it has fees and surrender charge potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And, and frankly, you know, as it should, that's how insurance products work. They, they are designed to be long-term products. Typically the insurance company does want to disincentivize people from coming in and coming out quickly. Yeah. Um, they need to make money off it as well. And, and should a policyholder pull the ripcord and bail out quickly, the insurance company often will have a loss. So that's why yeah. they, they, they hit you with a surrender charge to basically recoup costs that they may have had sure. in the early stages of this policy. One of which is commissions. Yeah. You know, Often the people who sell these get an upfront commission. And so the surrender penalty is largely there to reimburse the insurance company if the policyholder bails out early the insurance company uh, will lose that commission they paid to the person who sold it. So they want to get back some or all of it by, uh, you know, passing it through to you basically in the form of a surrender. Yeah. And the commissions could be significant, right? Uh, for the person, not, not, you know, it's okay, but that's could be one of the motivating factors for people really pushing this. Yeah. It depends on the product and how it's structured. So uh, for example, and this is just one small data point, but in my own IUL, I got the smallest I can get because I, I didn't want to overdo it. And I, I do have some reservations about how this is going to turn out, but I wanted to get one just to sort of see how sure. it works and follow it throughout time. Um, I, my premium is about $5,500 a year for 10 okay. years. The commission on it was about 1700 bucks okay. up so front one time. A little over so 30%. That's not bad. So that's 1700 divided by. Yeah. So that's about 30% commission on that first year's sure. premium. Um, little technical, but my policy, I intentionally put in as much cash value as I could for people who don't or can't and people who only put in the minimum needed to keep the insurance afloat, yeah. then the commissions are much higher relative to first year, uh, you know, first year premiums. So there are some people who sell these who, who do sell them to maximize their commission as opposed to maximize the, the benefit client, yeah. that the policyholder is going to get. Exactly. And that that's underhanded. Um, but if done well, properly structured, et cetera, sold for the right reasons, commissions aren't astronomically high on these. Sure. So, okay. But there is a commission yeah. nonetheless. Yeah. So gi given all this, uh, <laughs> what do you think? Should, should people avoid these or th they have a place? Um, I'll answer that in sort of two parts. One is cash value life insurance in general. Does it have a place? Absolutely. Not for everyone, but for people who have a, a want or a need for some sort of permanent life insurance coverage, no matter, you know, regardless how old they live till they'll have life sure. insurance. That fits the bill. There's other situations, like if you have a special needs child and when you pass, you're gonna leave money to him or her, or you need to leave money to him or her, you know, having a cash value policy could be a good way to do that. If you own a business and the majority of your net worth is tied up in your business and you die and you want your business partner to buy you sure. out, he or she might need a life insurance on you yeah. to have the capital to buy you out, something like that. Um, wealth transfer, life insurance is exceptionally tax advantage way to transfer wealth because the death benefit payout is tax free to the recipient. Sure. So for people who do have desires to, to leave money to heirs and do so really tax efficiently, permanent life insurance is a great tool. 
there's also there are the other benefits of being able to take loans against it. So, for example, this this gets a little technical, but like sequence of return risk. When you're in retirement and decumulating from a portfolio, and let's assume it's 2022, everything's yeah. down. Stock sure. market's down, bond yeah. market's down. You ideally don't want to have to sell stuff when it's down. It'd be good to have a buffer asset yeah. or a safe asset to tap. Cash value life insurance could be a good solution to, you know, to tap a loan against. So there's definitely a place for cash value life insurance. Specifically IULs, this is where I struggle. Again, it's not inherently a bad product. I never said it is. But it's riskier than, than most of those who sell it will lead you to believe. It's less guaranteed yeah. than those who sell it would lead you to believe. So you need to decide how much risk and uncertainty you're willing and able to take. If you want minimal risk, minimal uh, variability in outcome and, and uh, you know, uh, performance of the product, something like traditional whole life insurance is probably better suited for you. Much less potential upside yeah. than an IUL, but much less downside. Because they pay unknown. a dividend every year, basically. You're not getting zero. They, they pay a dividend. Yeah. It's yeah, it's more or less fixed. Yep. You know, I don't know what it is now. Five sure. percent, give or take a percentage point, probably. The cost of insurance is fixed throughout your life, whereas in IUL, the cost of insurance goes up every year yep. you age. So that's one extreme: is fairly low risk insurance, or at least you know low variability insurance would be whole life. The other end would be like variable universal life, where you are actually investing in mutual fund or mutual fund like products, where the cash values can whip around, go sure. up and go down you have more potential for growth in a variable universal life than you do a whole life, but much more downside risk yeah. as well. IUL sits in the middle. It's kind of like this, I want to have my cake and eat it too, or at least that's how sure. it's sold. You know, s too good to be true is, is the way it sounds. So I'm not saying it can't work out, but there's more risk than, than people will lead you to believe. There's less guarantees than people lead you to believe. So it's like you need to decide where on the risk spectrum of how much risk are you willing and able to take in your cash value life insurance, where do you sit? Whole life, yeah. variable universal, or do you want to kind of try to straddle both sides of the sure. fence? In which case, IUL can make sense yeah. for you. Yeah. That, that's about as, sci as scientific as I can put <laughs> okay. it. Okay, you know? yeah. I would, I would agree with that as far as the needs that, that people have for permanent life insurance, you know, that, that fitting, yeah. Yeah, yep. No, it could be a, uh, cash value life insurance could be a, a tremendously valuable product in the right set of circumstances. Yeah. It shouldn't be forced upon everyone as this sort of, you know, unicorn Swiss army knife, it yeah, does everything sure. for you type type product because it's that's not the way to position yeah. it. Makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think this is a good place to stop. Anything else you wanna, wanna mention before we wrap up? No, just to reiterate, I'm not against insurance as much as it may sound like I am. I'm against the way it's often yeah. sold, just, you know, just to be clear, so. Yeah, I agree. I That's mean, it. I'm always about making sure people have as much information as they can, you know, as they're making decisions and, and have it be truthful information as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. If people want to reach out to you, Andy, where do you suggest they do that? Either uh, LinkedIn, Andy Panko on LinkedIn, okay. or I have a um, website I created called Retirement Planning Education that's just sort of my extracurricular stuff, content creation, you can find me and contact me there. Okay. All right. Awesome. I'll put a, I'll put a link to both of those, uh, in the show notes again, this episode 192. Um, well, thanks, uh, for listening this week. And as always, if you have a listener question you want to have considered for a future episode, go to retirewithryan.com to propose your question. Have a great week and I'll talk to you next Wednesday. Take care. Thanks, Andy. Take care.